Okay, so today I wanted to do a video about the ways in which I find feminism to be misogynistic. And this was in part inspired by a book that I read recently called Feminist Fantasies by Phyllis Schlafly. And forward by Ann Coulter, and I knew I wasn't going to agree with everything in this book before I read it because she, uh, the author, is a renowned conservative, and while I do have some conservative le leanings, I am, um, I knew I wouldn't agree with her homophobia, for example, that was scattered throughout the book, but um, she did make a lot of good points, and there are points that I've really sort of been thinking about in regards to feminism anyway, and um, she expressed those things pretty well, so I'll talk about some of them. Uh, one of the things that she talked about was how uh, feminism in dismissing the importance of being a wife and being a mother um, has been uh, psychologically harmful to women, and I, I've always found that to be true, actually, about feminism. I I feel like uh, women who have been in traditional roles of being a wife and mother, um, a lot of them have made a very important contributions to society in those roles, and those roles shouldn't be dismissed just because um, they're they're not success in really male oriented terms where um, value is primarily measured by your success in the workplace or you know your success in politics or that kind of thing. Um, I think it. And thinking about the pay gap, that's another thing, um, you know, a lot of feminists try to say that the pay gap is due to sexism, when I think that, and you know, research has borne this out basically, that the pay gap is not due to sexism, it's merely due to the fact that women choose um, safer careers, that is, careers that are... Uh, Less, phys less physically risky. Um, they aren't willing to put in the hours. They aren't willing to sacrifice their family life to their careers to the same degree that men are. And therefore, they don't end up making as much money over the lifetime of you know their work. And I think by expecting women to have the same money earnings as men, I think it overlooks the fact that it's an admirable thing, at least in my opinion, that one of the genders is willing to recognize that money is not the most important thing in life, that um, family is more important that raising children or looking after your spouse, you know, should maybe be put at a higher premium than how much money you make. Um, and to expect a woman's worth um, to be defined by her um, career earnings, I think it's it's just it's misogynistic and it it discounts the importance of being a wife and being a mother um, the importance that that can have to society and just the fact that money isn't everything you know that that people and relationships are more important than money um, so anyway, that's just my opinion. And um, another thing Ms. Schlafly talks about in the book is how the sexual revolution has benefited 
men more than it has women, and therefore by um, embracing the idea of no-fault divorce, for example, and unilateral divorce, where one spouse can seek divorce, get divorced without consent of their partner. Um, she talks about how that has hurt women and children more so than it has hurt men. And, I mean, that's, that's pretty difficult to argue against. Um, you know, statistically, women do fare worse financially after divorce. Um, are probably less likely to get back to the financial level or above the financial level that they were at while they were married. Um, obviously, women are more likely to end up as single parents than men are, and that definitely puts an emotional and a financial strain on a person, something that I can attest to personally. And um, Ms. Schlafly also talks about the the cost of STDs, that women are more likely to contract STDs, though are just physically more vulnerable to STDs than men are. Um, obviously women alone um, have to face the cost physically of having an abortion, and women are primarily the ones that have to worry about birth control as well, normally, and, you know, I think that our society puts too much emphasis on sexual intercourse, and I also think that that women and men both need to take more responsibility for birth control. Um, I, I just think that that would benefit people altogether. Um, I I don't like abortion. I I see it as a necessary evil. Um, I don't believe it should be outlawed. But then at the same time, I I do think that if um, that it is harmful to a woman's health and harmful to her psychology and therefore if yeah I think that women should feel more empowered to say no to sex and, and men should too and in in the ways that the sexual revolution has made um, men and women feel badly for um, maybe having less of an active sex life than is considered normal. I think that that's a negative thing. Um, I do applaud the, the openness of the sexual revolution and encouraging people in a lot of ways to be more honest about their sexuality. I think that is a good thing, but um, to the extent that the sexual revolution has um, made society put too much emphasis on sex, I think, um, you know, I think you need a balance, you know, a, I don't want to go back to, I don't think anybody wants to go back to um, pre kenzie times, you know, where masturbation was considered a mortal sin and um, anybody that had premarital sex was, especially a woman, was just unfit to be in society, but um, at the same time, I think that people should be encouraged to explore, you know, non-intercourse ways of expressing their sexuality as a means of preventing STDs and preventing unwanted pregnancies. So, now also, I find the patriarchy theory to be rather misogynistic in the sense that it paints women as victims, which, while it may be psychologically comforting for women to see themselves in that role, it is not empowering, and it is not encouraging women to take 
responsibility for their own lives. Um, it is not encouraging them to take the reins and be more assertive in all of the things that can help women get ahead in whatever it is that they want to do in life, be it being a wife and mother or being a career person or, or trying to find a balance between the two. Um, you know, it, it is just, uh, it's not helpful. It's just not helpful. Even if it is true, and I really don't think that it is true, um, I, I think that for the most part, um, society treats men as disposable and the reason that men may be treated with a little bit more respect when they become successful versus women is because, you know, it's acknowledged on some level psychologically that they had to overcome so much to get to that level versus women who are um, put on more of a pedestal and seen by society as needing help and not, um, you know, creatures that should be made to, to do everything for themselves. Um, Ms. Schleifley talks a lot about women in the military and how they're not physically as strong as men and how um, pregnancy obviously is a big issue for women who are of military age, especially in the lower ranks. They're basically in their, you know, in their prime fertility. So, you know, it isn't fair that so many female soldiers get pregnant, and yet it it's looked upon as they should be advancing and getting to the same levels as men. Um, in the officer positions and such. Uh, you know, I, I believe that women should be given an equal opportunity. I don't believe in equal outcomes necessarily. Um, I think in some jobs that require a lot of physical strength, I think that it should just be accepted that women may never reach the same um, level as men, and I don't think that gender differences should be ignored, or you know, if you acknowledge them, you're you're considered just this horrible sexist person. You know, I think you know, there should be a level of honesty. I think there are some women who, you know, very unique women maybe who are as strong as the average man physically, but. You know, it shouldn't be assumed that you're going to have, like I said, equal opportunity does not mean equal outcomes. And I don't think that that sort of thing should be forced with affirmative action and, and that kind of thing. So, you know, and I also think that, I, I think that the military is anti-family in general. And I think when you talk about women being forced to deploy and leave their newborns at home, you know, she... Ms. Schleifley talks in the book about how horrible that is and how mothers shouldn't be forced away from their their newborn children and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I, I think, personally having lived in a military town for years, I, I've seen how long military deployments, period, rip apart families. And whether it's the mother or the father, it takes a horrible toll on people, you know. And I, I think that fathers are important just as mothers are and that, you know, just our, our military culture in general should be more family oriented and I don't think that a limiting women's service and, and giving them more time with their children and that kind of thing, I don't think that that, I don't think that they are alone in needing that time with their family. I think that it should be more acknowledged that, that fathers need more time with their families, too, and that they're important. So, um, she 
also talked in the book about tax law and how unfair it was that women who took care of their own children didn't get the same tax credit as women who uh, paid, you know, went out to work and then paid someone else to watch their child. And, you know, I think that that is a good point. Um, you know, if women are going to get, or families are going to get deductions for child care, then they should also get deductions for choosing to stay home with their child even if they don't work. Um, like there, there was an effort by feminists to eliminate uh, social security benefits for non-working spouses, and I think that that isn't fair. You know, just because a woman is a wife and takes care of her own children and takes care of a home and and does the same job as say a hired housekeeper or a hired nanny would do, I don't think that she should um, be without social security benefits just because she never actually worked outside the home. I think that is is misogynistic and it's also uh, not looking out for the welfare of children who, in my opinion, are better off being cared for by a parent who obviously has more emotional investment than someone who's being paid to take care of that child in general. I mean, not every parent, not every caretaker, but in general, yes, that's the truth. And another thing that she talks about in the book, which I wish she had taken a different angle on, and if she had, I think it would have been a more effective point, and I could have agreed with her, uh, but she talks about the, uh, I guess, the association of lesbianism with feminism, and how a lot of feminists have basically more or less chosen to be lesbians because they felt that rejecting men and, and rejecting traditional relationships and traditional heterosexual marriage was uh, empowering to women. And I find that kind of thing distasteful, personally. I don't have anything against anybody being gay, obviously, <laughs> I'm bisexual, but, you know, I, if I were to be in a long-term relationship with a woman, I would want it to be because she genuinely desired me, not because she made a choice to pick me over a man that maybe she is more attracted to, but she's trying to make a political statement by being with a woman. I think that kind of thing sends the message that sexual orientation is primarily a choice, and I don't think that that is a good message to send, uh, especially as homosexuals are trying to gain more acceptance in society. I think that people should understand that um, it can be, I suppose, a choice, but that it isn't for most people. Um, you know, and I, I just find it, I don't know, I just find the whole thing rather a degradation of sexuality, personally, I just, and it's, it's, it's misogynistic for women to be expected to settle for partners who choose them but don't generally desire them the way I, I think that people should be genuinely desired if a relationship is to have um, true lasting potential. Um, and then also another thing that bothered me, it, like I said, it, it Mish Lively talks about how bad lesbianism is in the book, you know, and I wish she had not taken that bigoted stance. I wish she had come at it from the, from the point of view that I come at it. Anyway, another thing that she talks about in the book is 
pornography, and the way she presents the argument in the book, it is as if all feminists are pro-porn and pro-prostitution rights, and that definitely isn't true. And I, the book, to me, would have been better if she had uh, talked about the fact that there is a very deep division within feminism about what kind of attitudes should be had about pornography, whether it is degrading to women, harmful to women, or it can be a positive thing, you know, if it's something that a woman freely chooses and isn't pressured into by, you know, economics or um, feeling inferior in society, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, uh, I, I just wish that she had talked about that instead of presenting the argument as if all feminists have one viewpoint on um, pornography and prostitution, which they don't. Well, she talks about pornography, she doesn't really talk about prostitution, but the, the two things are kind of closely related. So, anyway, um, that was a little bit about the book and some of my opinions about feminism and um, some of the ways that I feel that it is misogynistic and misogyny is bad and thank you for watching my video. <laughs>